Well, good afternoon. Uh, <clears throat> I'm David Blight, the director of the Gilda Lerman Center for the Study of Slavery and Abolition at Yale. Uh, welcome back to one of our uh, occasional uh, Wednesday programs, uh, usually at noon. Uh, we don't do these in person right now. Someday we will, but it is great to see such a wonderful audience turning out uh, for this event. Now, uh, I want to get right to our guest. But I would first say that for many of you who, of course, know something about the Underground Railroad in American history, uh, it tends to be seen as a land-based activity, uh, not without reason. You know, the place of Canada, the border of the Ohio River, the border of Pennsylvania, Maryland, and so on and so on. Um, been, been some recent terrific books, great scholarly works on the Underground Railroad by Fergus Bordovich, uh, Eric Foner, uh, who studied New York City, and then a, a, a big comprehensive work by uh, Richard Blackett uh, in recent years. And there have been others, I'm leaving people out. But though many of these scholars have dealt to some degree with the maritime story, the, the maritime escape story of American fugitive slaves, uh, no one has pulled together this story as comprehensively as has uh, Timothy Walker. And uh, it's a thrill to welcome Tim to a GLC talk. I got to meet Tim, uh, I don't know, it's two and a half years ago or so in New Bedford, a favorite town of mine because of its many associations with Frederick Douglass and because I love the Whaling Museum there. Uh, my colleague here at the center, uh, Michelle Zacks, introduced us. In fact, Michelle, because of her own uh, intellectual interest in this field of maritime history, uh, had known Tim considerably be before I ever met Tim uh, through uh, seminars and events that they had attended and papers the two of them had given at, at various conferences. Uh, I just wanna introduce Tim and then we can get started, although Michelle will have a few remarks as well. Uh, this is a book, by the way, uh, entitled, as the title of the uh, event today is, Sailing to Freedom, Maritime Dimensions of the Underground Railroad. Now in this book, and I urge everybody to get it, UMass Press, uh, a publisher I've published with before uh, at least twice, um, you're gonna hear about the Underground Railroad in maritime dimensions from Charleston to New York, coastal North Carolina, coastal Virginia, um, uh, strategies of escape out of various other ports, then entry ports like here along the coast of Connecticut, of course, New York City, um, ports of Eastern Massachusetts. This is very much an oceanic maritime story. Now, Timothy Walker uh, is a graduate of Hiram College, MA and PhD at Boston University. He's professor of history at the University of Massachusetts at Dartmouth, which is not very far up the, up the road there from New Bedford. Um, he serves there also uh, on the board of the Center of Portuguese Studies at, at Dartmouth. He is a scholar of maritime history, colonial overseas expansion, the transatlantic uh, slave trade. And he's uh, affiliated with the center at uh, uh, the Universidade Nova de Lisboa in Portugal. Did a Fulbright in Portugal, did dissertation research in Portugal. Uh, comes by his credentials on the slave trade very seriously because of all this time in Portugal. Uh, in 2018, Tim was appointed a guest investigator at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, uh, drawing historic climate data from archived whaling logbooks and Portuguese colonial and other kinds of maritime documents. Uh, it is Tim who drew together these various authors, including himself, in this, in this book, Sailing to Freedom, which as I said, is, is the most comprehensive take we've now had in, on the maritime history of this story, especially in this recent modern revival of 
serious study of this thing we've all come to call the Underground Railroad. So Tim, uh, a very warm welcome to you. And I wanna turn it over to Michelle Zacks, who also has a few announcements, but also her own, I think, uh, introduction of you. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, David. Uh, I just wanted to say hello, add my welcome to Tim Walker. Um, as David mentioned, Tim and I met about five years ago, 2016, at the uh, Munston Institute of Maritime Studies at Mystic Seaport. Um, it was a summertime uh, research institute, a wonderful experience for, for both of us and for all the participants. Um, and uh, I think, Tim, you at that point, you were working on this book project, I believe. We had just um, started, yes. Yeah. So it's great to see it come to fruition, and we're just delighted to have you here. Um, so without further ado, welcome. I just will we'll make a quick announcement that we have another GLC at Lunch program coming up on November 17th. That's with Gretchen Long, who is a visiting professor at the GLC this semester. She's a professor of history at Williams College. And her talk is, my mother would go hunting at night and get a possum to feed us. Black women, power and provisions in the antebellum South. And I'll put a link to the registration for that in the chat so you all can sign up. So without further ado, welcome Tim and take it away. Well, thank you so much, Michelle and David. I'm, I'm so grateful to have this opportunity to talk about the work here uh, at, uh, at the GLC. And um, I'm going to share my screen. I have a number of images that I'd like to share with everyone. Um, and I should mention that I'm actually uh, in my home in New Bedford. So I'm very close to the New Bedford waterfront where a lot of the, the culmination of many of these escapes uh, plays out. And so uh, let me get my screen on here and we can start. There we are. So this is the cover of the book. And again, Sailing to Freedom, Maritime Dimensions of the Underground Railroad. Um, as you've probably gathered from my introduction, I, I don't really, um, I, I come to this as someone who was originally trained in early modern European history and maritime history. But I moved to New Bedford in 2004 to take up a job at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. And I began to realize just how fascinating New Bedford's history was and its relationship to uh, the Underground Railroad as a, as a destination for people who had escaped enslavement and ended up uh, in, uh, in New Bedford. And so about um, more than a decade ago now, I was approached by, um, I'm just going to go back for a second. I was approached by uh, the uh, president of the New Bedford Historical Society, a woman named Lee Blake. Uh, that the, and the New Bedford Historical Society focuses on the stories of people of color, uh, indigenous Americans um, and, and African-Americans and Cape Verdeans, people who came to the New Bedford area. It focuses on telling their history. And uh, Lee Blake and I decided that one of the stories that needed to be told about New Bedford was uh, the story of New Bedford as a destination in the Underground Railroad. Now, here's a map that is sort of a general map about how the Underground Railroad is, uh, is normally taught in the United States. And while it's usually, I think you can see my cursor, while there usually is a nod to the coastal element of escape, the overwhelming amount of documentation focuses on this terrestrial story. Uh, and, and so the great deal of, of documentation, historiography focuses on that. But I wanted to take issue and maybe challenge some of the concepts that are embodied in this map. Um, for one thing, the map shows escape routes starting over land from very far in the deep south, from places like Georgia and South Carolina and North Carolina and Southern Virginia and going northward. And similarly, other parts of the sort of core of the deep south uh, that, that overland escapes, according to this map, began in the far deep south. But as Fergus Bordowicz pointed out in his book, uh, Bound for Canaan, uh, the overwhelming majority of documented successful overland escapes began very close to a border with a free state. So beginning somewhere in Virginia or Kentucky or Missouri, eastern uh, Missouri or northern Kentucky or northern Virginia, 
escaping to places like Pennsylvania and Ohio and Indiana and Illinois and Iowa. So very, very few people uh, escape from the deep south by land. That's established by the documentation that we have about the Underground Railroad. In fact, Bordowicz goes on to say that escape overland from the deep south was virtually impossible. And if we think about it, we can understand why. The logistical challenges of escaping overland from the south, if you were a fugitive, enslaved African-American person traveling through a, a countryside that is hostile to you, where almost every person of color is in fact enslaved. And if you don't have the proper pass, the proper permission from your owner, uh, uh, from the person who owns you, if you are trying to organize food and water and shelter and a place uh, to keep out of sight, if you're evading recapture by patrols of uh, uh, slave patrols that are constantly vigilant for people trying to escape enslavement. The fact of the matter is, is that overland escape from the far south was very, very difficult. And if you were, um, if you were more than just a few days walk away at the most, your, your chances of a successful escape overland were actually pretty small. By contrast, and this is where we really started to think about the importance of the maritime dimension of this story. If you're anywhere along the coastal Carolinas, Georgia, Virginia, in the Chesapeake Bay, if you're anywhere near the waterfront, and of course there was a very, very large population of enslaved people along this, this coastal area of the South because of uh, agricultural work done by enslaved labor, but also lots of other work done by enslaved labor. If you could get on a vessel going North, uh, then you could relatively easily and without impediment find your way to a northern free port in a matter of a few days. It's just a few days sail uh, up the Gulf Stream, taking advantage of the currents along the East Coast to get to um, uh, a free northern port. Now, if we look at, um, oops, there we go. If we look at a publication, uh, one of the earliest publications of the Underground Railroad, which is uh, Siebert's book, uh, The Underground Railroad, published in 1898. Uh, first of all, he notes all of these Midwestern um, uh, Underground Railroad routes. So I was myself, I was born in Detroit, and that was a major crossover into Canada. But I grew up outside of Dayton, Ohio. And so all through my youth, I heard stories about uh, uh, about the Underground Railroad and, and its importance as a terrestrial phenomenon. But I didn't think very much about the, um, the maritime side until I moved to Massachusetts for graduate school and then moved to New Bedford uh, to become a professor at, at UMass Dartmouth. So that's when I really started thinking about the significance of this, uh, of this overseas story. So this all started to come together back in uh, 2011 when Lee Blake and I applied for funding uh, for uh, a national endowment of the humanities grant. The, the story of how the book develops is the story of this uh, funding from the NEH that allowed us to tell the story of New Bedford's place and role in the Underground Railroad. And we ran this workshop uh, for, for teachers, for uh, American K through 12 teachers who came from across the United States we always had at least 25 or 26 states represented, uh, 80 teachers every summer. And we did this in 2011, 2013, and 2015. We were refunded for 2021, but we've had to postpone because of COVID. But the point is, is that this, uh, these workshops for teachers allowed us to bring together scholars to tell the story of New Bedford's place in the Underground Railroad. And as a consequence of, uh, of conversing with people like uh, David Soselski and Jeff Bolster and, uh, uh, and uh, a variety of other people, um, Kate Clifford Larson and uh, Catherine Grover and a number of others, we began to realize that this was a much bigger story and a more important story than we imagined. Because the, as the evidence started to pile up, we started to see that there were indeed hundreds, if not thousands or more, um, uh, documented cases of people escaping by water along the eastern seaboard from the far south uh, going towards the north. And so while it was really unusual, if not almost unheard of, of people escaping over land from the deep south, almost all successful escapes from the far south, from the far coastal south, are achieved by water. 
and it's quite a large number of people, much larger than I than than had previously been uh, recognized or acknowledged by Underground Railroad scholarship. So, at the end of this, uh, at the end of 2015, having done the workshops three times, we determined that gee, there really ought to be a scholarly volume that deals with this. And so I started the process of collecting uh, folks who, uh, colleagues and fellow scholars who had worked on different parts of the Eastern seaboard and had dealt with uh, the story of people of escaping uh, via water from, from ports. And so the question started to come up, uh, how does this happen? What explains this? Why, what are the circumstances that allowed for so many people to escape from uh, the Eastern seaboard, particularly in the far South. And one of the answers to that question is that if you look at the labor pool, the labor force engaged in working on working waterfronts, in port cities, in the waterways of the far South, it's almost entirely uh, enslaved uh, African-American workers. And so if you look at what kind of labor they're doing, they are waterfront dock and wharf workers. They're longshoremen who are loading and unloading ships, stevedores. They're warehousemen who uh, have an intimate relationship with the vessels that come and go from the southern ports. They are drovers and teamsters who are delivering goods, provisions to the ves vessels and taking away the cargo that they deliver. All of the shipyard labor doing maintenance on vessels, caulking and uh, repair work and rigging, almost all of it is done by highly skilled, it must be said, uh, African-American workers who, uh, who are trained up in these, in these uh, fields in the course of their enslaved labor. Not only that, but uh, ancillary work that is also extremely important to the ports and to the waterways of the South. Uh, African-American watermen are doing essential skilled labor, uh, that of fishermen, oystermen, lightermen, uh, loading and unloading vessels that are anchored out to the harbor. Uh, they they uh, are commanding vessels called lighters that, that carry goods to and from uh, boats that are not on the wharf or on the docks. Uh, they served as deckhands on uh, coastal watercraft. Many of them were even skilled enough that they understood the navigational hazards of the ports and the waterways that they were navigating in, and so they became pilots. Um, many of these uh, folks are of uh, uh, have extraordinary experience and extraordinary skill uh, on the waterfront. And these kinds of skills uh, are constitute a kind of uh, uh, critical mass of strategic knowledge, strategic knowledge that allows African Americans on the waterfront to understand the rhythm of the ports and how best to use that strategic knowledge to their advantage to escape enslavement. They know when ships are about to leave harder, harbor. They know uh, the, the, um, the kinds of um, uh, formalities that have to be undertaken before a ship can clear harbor, and they know how to evade authorities consequently. They understand uh, the rhythm of uh, ships that have to leave with the tide, so they know when to get on a vessel. They form relationships with northern crews who may be sympathetic to uh, the abolitionist cause and therefore might be inclined to help them escape from uh, a, a southern port by maybe making uh, a place for them uh, uh, to hide aboard the vessel amongst the cargo or in a uh, secret location inside a, a vessel. So there are all kinds of ways that, all kinds of opportunities that arise from having been employed in this waterfront labor force that gave opportunities to African-Americans to escape. Um, the overwhelming majority of the workers on the waterfront, of course, are men. And we see that in the demographics of uh, the escapees, the folks who are freedom seekers who, who successfully find their way to the North, uh, generally are men, although, uh, women are also uh, successful in their bids to find freedom in the North by water, and we'll see some stories that, uh, that reflect that. So African-American boatmen uh, constitute this labor force of a skin, uh, essential skilled labor, and we see this reflected in the art of, uh, of the period, the antebellum period, where uh, even uh, waterfront uh, labor is, uh, is depicted as being mostly African-American men. Um, the census of 1860 uh, and previous censuses that were done by the US government, there were maps produced of 
some of these censuses. And, and this kind of drives the point home. If we look at just South Carolina, um, we see that all of the waterways uh, are, uh, this is where the most uh, in, uh, intense uh, population, the densest population of enslaved people are near the ports and the waterways that of course gave access uh, to the ocean going vessels that carried the goods from the plantations out to sea and on to market. Uh, so it's not just the people working in the ports, it's also the watermen who are responsible for shifting the, um, the, the plantation produced goods along the ocean, uh, the, 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 the tide water waterways that were the avenues, the highways to bring heavy goods down to port to put them on vessels. There were no uh, quality roads to speak of. All heavy goods, including agricultural plantation produced goods had to be moved by water and almost all of the labor moving those goods by water was enslaved uh, African-Americans. So another way that we learn about uh, this story is through the appearance of thousands of runaway slave ads that happen uh, in the second half of the uh, 18th century and during the 19th century, right up to the Civil War. Uh, there are roughly 200,000 extant uh, runaway slave ads in American newspapers starting quite early. And a very large proportion of them um, uh, mention that the, uh, the owner uh, who's placing the ad, the ads often include a lot of key information. And the owner will describe ways that uh, he or she thinks their property uh, has made their escape. And so in this, uh, in this uh, example here from 1772 from the Virginia Gazette in Williamsburg, uh, we have a 20-year-old a uh, African-American man, and his owner goes out of his way to note that as he has been used to the sea, he will probably endeavor to get on board some ship and make his escape out of the colony. All masters of vessels are therefore forewarned from harboring or carrying him off at their peril. And so there is a legal, legal structure that is enacted by Southern municipalities and Southern states to create uh, legal um, penalties and disincentives for uh, vessel masters of captains uh, for uh, helping or, or assisting uh, slaves to run away. Um, but we also see that the evidence of the runaway slave ads again and again and again gives us an indication that escape by sea was, was quite common. Uh, this is the uh, runaway slave ad that was placed on behalf of President Washington in uh, 1796 uh, uh, that uh, shows that his enslaved woman, uh, Ona Judge, uh, was suspected of having escaped by water. As she may attempt to escape by water, all masters of vessels and others are cautioned against receiving her on board. And in fact, she did uh, escape by water uh, to the north and, uh, and managed to escape re-enslavement uh, for the rest of her life. Um, another one here, let's see. Yeah, uh, so this is one from uh, the mid 1840s and it mentions New Bedford. Uh, the probability is that she has gone towards New Bedford as she has a father living there. Uh, and so we have this evidence of New Bedford being a suspected place uh, of, uh, of, uh, of refuge for someone trying to escape enslavement. I wanna draw our attention. Oh, here's one other one from also, um, in which we see both of the both. Uh, so this is a, a mother and a, and a child. Uh, both of them have had a long time relation with Negro fishermen at the bayou. And so having contact with people who are also uh, experts in watercraft in in uh, in the the uh, the knowledge of maritime work were also uh, suspected of aiding and abetting uh, would be fugitives. I want to draw our attention now to another kind of uh, ad. This is an advertisement placed not by an owner of a slave, but rather by a master of a vessel. Uh, this is in 1797. It's in a New Bedford newspaper, the uh, New Bedford uh, Medley or Marine Journal. And uh, many of these newspapers, of course, circulated up and down the coast to uh, and, and stories that they, that they included uh, circulated as well and were reprinted by other newspapers. But after this, uh, the, uh, 
congressional le legislation of 1793, uh, the, uh, the masters of vessels were required to um, uh, at least to give themselves legal color cover. Uh, they worked very hard to uh, publish evidence that they were not responsible for any runaways that may have appeared on their vessel. And so here we have a wonderful example of that. This is uh, uh, a shipmaster, uh, Tabor, who was uh, in uh, New Bedford, and he was the commander of the Sloop uh, Union, who sailed from the York River in Virginia on or about the 28th of March last uh, to this port, New Bedford, that on the day after sailing, I discovered a Negro on board said Sloop who had concealed himself unbeknownst to me. So he's making the argument that he had nothing to do with this, that this was done uh, without his knowledge or his consent. It appearing inconsistent for me to return, the wind being ahead, I proceeded on my voyage. So he's saying that the weather did not allow him to turn the vessel around and return his property, uh, to, to return the, uh, the, 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 the property of the uh, enslaved person back to the port from which he had come. And so he has to proceed on his voyage and landed him in New Bedford, this port. He calls his name James. Is that his real name? We don't know. He's about 27 years old and says he belongs to Mr. Shackelford, a planter in Kings and Queens County, Virginia. So we have to kind of read between the lines here to know that um, the, the master of this vessel uh, is, uh, is really trying to give himself legal coverage so that he's not prosecutable for this kind of uh, a, a, a crime uh, of, of taking away knowingly an enslaved person. We also should mention that this newspaper was a weekly publication. And so uh, by the time the news of this, uh, of this announcement, this legal notice was given in a newspaper, uh, it would have met, um, uh, it would have been uh, quite a while before the, uh, the owner found out about where his property, the enslaved person might be. Um, so I also wanted to point out that we have a number of published accounts that start to come out uh, in um, in the uh, in the late nineteenth century of people who escaped uh, from slavery by water, and they often note how they did it, how this happened. Uh, of the escape narratives that are published, um, and I, I have this information from uh, a very fine scholar, Jonathan Schroeder, who was originally going to be part of this. Uh, uh, project, but in the end had to drop out. But he, he through his research, verified that uh, of, 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 a, of the over 100 published uh, slave narratives of the late 19th century, 70% of them mention escape by water. And so this is clearly a big part of the story that uh, had been uh, overlooked. So here's, here's an example. This is Thomas Jones, who in 1849 uh, gets on a vessel from uh, Wilmington, North Carolina, and ends up in New York Harbor. Uh, the crew of the vessel wanted to try to re-enslave him, so he has to escape on a raft. Uh, and he recounts this in his, um, in his narrative that is published then in Boston uh, in 1862. And we have numerous other uh, examples of this. This is Elizabeth Blakely, who was a teenager, 16, 15 years old, escaped from sea, uh, by sea from Wilmington, North Carolina uh, in about 1850. Uh, and uh, W.E.B. Du Bois published an account of this uh, in his uh, magazine in the 1920s, but it was a well-known story by the time he publishes. Uh, this is Austin Bierce's memoir about uh, working on... Um, uh, uh, in the Underground Railroad in Boston uh, called Reminiscences of the Fugitive Slave Law Days in 1880, but he included illustrations of landing uh, fugitives in Boston Harbor surreptitiously by night uh, and, and then spiriting them away to uh, safer places outside of Boston where they wouldn't likely be re-enslaved. Um, also in William Still's book um, about the Underground Railroad as a, as a uh, operative operating in Philadelphia, helping hundreds of uh, escaped uh, enslaved people coming through the port of Philadelphia. Uh, he recounts a number of stories. This is uh, Captain Albert Fontaine who regularly ran a packet schooner along the East Coast and carried 
uh, untold numbers of enslaved people hidden away on his schooner, taking them to Philadelphia and from there uh, onward to uh, other uh, places where they could find refuge. And this is published in 1872 uh, in Philadelphia, but we have a, 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 a vivid image of uh, a, a search of a vessel that's about to leave uh, harbor and uh, in Norfolk, Virginia, where the city authorities are quite certain that that there are people on board, but they couldn't find them. And in fact, in this instance, there were over 20 people secreted away on the vessel uh, that safely made it to, uh, to Philadelphia and into uh, William Still's care. Uh, this is an image also from the same uh, publication. Uh, and this is landing fugitive, uh, fugitives from Norfolk, Virginia in Philadelphia at League Island in 1856. Uh, and this was a case where you had a, a fairly significant number of people on board, including a number of women and children who are, um, who are given uh, the opportunity to escape enslavement. So I wanna turn our attention now to New Bedford uh, as a destination. And we spend a fair amount of time in the book talking about uh, New Bedford. Um, I'll say this about the book before we, we move here though. The book is organized chronologically. And the book depends on the work of a number of really fine scholars, uh, all of whom looked at different geographical regions of the East Coast of the United States. Uh, and so we begin with a, a chapter um, um, that, uh, by Michael Thompson that focuses on uh, South Carolina. David Saselski looks at North Carolina. Uh, and then two fine chapters by Cassandra Newby Alexandra and Cheryl LaRoche that look at both Virginia and uh, Maryland waterfronts. Um, then we start to move up to the Connecticut coast uh, and to New York City. Uh, a young scholar, uh, Morel Lukey, who was a student of, um, uh, of Marcus Redeker and had just finished her PhD about New York City as a, as a, uh, a transit point for um, people who were escaping enslavement. She provides us a wonderful chapter about New York City. Um, Alyssa Engelman, who's a public scholar working at Mystic Seaport, uh, did a chapter about um, uh, Eastern Connecticut and the ports of Stonington and Mystic uh, and, uh, and uh, New London, and how uh, several families were involved in the abolitionist movement there, and, and discusses how we, as, how as public historians, uh, would, um, would uh, present that information for uh, an audience at Mystic Seaport Museum. Uh, then we have uh, Cheryl, uh, sorry, um, Catherine Grover, who did a, a chapter about the Cape and Islands, uh, Martha's Vineyard and uh, Nantucket's role in the Underground Railroad and the maritime dimension of it, uh, and also made ties with the abolitionists in that part, southern, southeastern part of the state with people in Boston. Um, my colleague at UMass Dartmouth, Lynn Travers, did a chapter about the kind of work and the kind of activities that people coming to New Bedford would have practiced to make a living once they had escaped to New Bedford. Uh, and you know, New Bedford is an interesting case. It was known as the Fugitives Gibraltar, the place that was a secure and safe location for people escaping enslavement. Uh, it, as a city, had the highest percentage of the population uh, per capita uh, of any Northern city that was uh, of African-American descent. And if you look at uh, the, the, uh, the places when, when people of African descent gave their place of birth, uh, they often, uh, people who were living in New Bedford, said that they had been born in the South. Uh, and this gives an indication that uh, the chances were very high that they had escaped from enslavement to come to New Bedford. People who had already maritime skills could put those maritime skills to work in New Bedford. Uh, and, uh, and so New Bedford becomes a place that, uh, that uh, had a population of uh, abolitionists, the, the, the business of whaling. Uh, and of course, New Bedford is the capital of whaling in the, in the first half of the 19th century. Uh, the business of whaling was largely in the hands of Quakers and who, were, who were abolitionists frequently uh, and active in the abolitionist movement. And so uh, the, the African-American population found not only a place where they could put their skills to work, but a place that would protect them from, uh, from the dangers of re-enslavement. Of course, this is the first home and freedom of, uh, of Frederick Douglass and, and Anna. Uh, this is the home where he lived, the, uh, the Nathan and Polly Johnson home, which is 
also the, the headquarters of the New Bedford uh, Historical Society. And right next to them, uh, this yellow building is an 18th century uh, Quaker meeting house. The new meeting house built in the 1830s out of brick is just diagonal across the street from where these buildings are in New Bedford. Uh, of course, Douglas comes uh, in, uh, in 1838 and uh, found skills, uh, found uh, work on the waterfront. But the other reason why, um, oh, sorry, and he's using a, a Siemens protection paper very similar to this one that was issued in New Bedford in 1836 to an African-American mariner uh, to, uh, to, uh, to provide proof that he was in fact a, a free man of color and, uh, and that he should not be um, uh, hindered in any movement around the country. But the docks of New Bedford, because it was such an active whaling port with thousands of mariners coming and going annually, provided work for, um, uh, for people who had escaped from enslavement in the South, but it also provided a way for people who were uh, actively being hunted by their owners. You could sign on to a whaling voyage and be gone for two to three years uh, and thereby evade uh, any possibility of being recaptured and, and brought back into slavery by, by bounty hunters uh, uh, in the North. And so this makes New Bedford a very uh, attractive option for uh, would-be uh, uh, freedom seekers who are, who are trying to uh, uh, find a way to avoid being taken back into slavery. Just finished with a couple more images. Uh, this is another shot of New Bedford Harbor in the 1860s. Um, some of the escaped persons made uh, names for themselves. Now, we don't know for sure that Lewis Temple uh, was, in fact, a fugitive from enslavement. There's evidence to suggest that he was, but it isn't uh, concrete. But what he did do as a working blacksmith in the port of New Bedford is he revolutionized the whaling industry by creating a new harpoon type that... Um, uh, that made it easier to hunt whales. And so he is remembered in New Bedford as uh, a very important person to the whaling industry, uh, a blacksmith of, of African-American descent who uh, is quite likely a fugitive from enslavement. And in the art of the whaling industry, we see all kinds of evidence. Uh, and this is of course work that, um, uh, that furthers the, the work that was began by Jeff, begun by Jeff Bolster uh, with his uh, publication Blackjacks, but the focus on just the sheer number, the percentages of African-Americans who are participating in uh, the American um, uh, uh, maritime industries, and particularly whaling, uh, where they are represented in the artwork of the whaling industry again and again and again. My colleague, uh, Michael Dyer at the uh, New Bedford Whaling Museum, he's the maritime curator, has just come out with a book about the art of the American whale hunt and the evidence of African-American participation in this is, is just overwhelming. So uh, there's another image. So uh, to, to kind of wrap up and finalize my part of this, um, a few themes that, that I wanted to drive home with the collection of this volume uh, is that the Underground Railroad is a, uh, an important, obviously a, an extraordinarily important topic in American US historiography, but we haven't put enough attention on the maritime side of it. It's a story that is sort of hiding in plain sight. We, we know it's there. It was recognized by scholars in the 19th century who wrote about the Underground Railroad. They, the evidence in, uh, in Siebert's and, and, and William Still's book uh, is, is, is very clear that they were entirely aware of the importance and the necessity of, uh, of escapes from the South being done by water. Um, Daniel Drayton, who tried to pilot the schooner Pearl with a very large number of uh, escaped African-Americans from Washington, D.C., down the Potomac River, and who is captured, he wrote in his memoir that any time a vessel stopped that was known to be of northern uh, from a northern port, if it stopped in a southern port, there were always people uh, coming to try to find a way to get on board. And so this was well known to folks at the end of the 19th century, but we've lost that connection to maritime history uh, at the end of the 20th and early 21st century, I think. And so we tend not to look at this important maritime dimension of, of, uh, of what is you know, the rest of this 
big underground railroad story. Um, so the purpose of publishing this book in a way is to, is to try to fundamentally rethink how we uh, envision and how we conceptualize the Underground Railroad. Um, it really puts the focus on, in terms of agency, it puts the focus on the people of color themselves who have these strategic skills, the strategic knowledge of maritime, um, uh, under, an understanding of the maritime world that allows them the possibility of getting on vessels and escaping to the north. These are skills that anyone working just a few miles inland on a plantation in a landlocked context would not have developed. Uh, and unless they had regular uh, contact with the sea, they wouldn't have had the opportunities that coastal workers and port workers had uh, working uh, along the, the coasts of the, of the states of the far south. Uh, and so by, by putting the emphasis on uh, the knowledge that people parlayed and leveraged to make their way to freedom, uh, it also shows that the folks who did this uh, often did it as um, uh, attempts that, that came uh, opportunistically. They made last minute decisions to get on a vessel when they had the chance to do so. And in so doing, they often skirted much of the, um, the sort of organized um, networks of the Underground Railroad that existed in the North. And landing in a Northern port like New Bedford, like Boston, uh, from there, it was a relatively uh, easier pathway to get to places like Canada uh, or, or upstate New York, where one could live in relative peace and relative lack of fear of being re-enslaved. So I think I will leave it there and open up for questions. Uh, I hope that my explanation has been clear and that I've given you a lot to think about. Uh, but I think I'll pause there and we can uh, move to the, the Q&A part of the um, of the presentation. Thank you so very much for this opportunity to talk about my book. Uh, well, Tim, thank you uh, so much. Uh, you've given us a lot to think about. And uh, again, I applaud our audience. We've got a great audience here, over 50 people, uh, which is more than we get in person for these Wednesday talks. So um, I wanna start the questioning here with just a couple of questions for you. Well, first of all, a comment. Thank you for stressing just how important a source those runaway ads are. I mean, everybody who works on this ends up to a great extent using, in fact, even uh, the old book done by Schwenninger and John Hope Franklin, uh, they managed to come up with, remember that old, it's 25 years ago now or something. They came up with some rough numbers about escaped slaves, but they did it mostly from runaway ads. Uh, and some from court records. So those runaway ads are such a source. Um, anyway, and, and you really showed us that. And if May I interject a quick comment? Because I realized I completely, I forgot to mention our, our, the, the capstone chapter of our, of our book, which is Megan Jeffries, um, who is a, a, a doctoral candidate at um, Cornell. She's working with um, uh, Ed Baptist there to, uh, to uh, collect together in one big database, all of these runaway slave ads. This is called the Freedom of the Move on the Move project. And uh, it was through their work that we really uh, started to see the sheer numbers. We don't, we don't have concrete numbers, but we know the numbers are very high of runaway slave ads that mention escape by water. But a lot of that work is being done at Cornell and, and we're, we're, we're anticipating with, with, uh, you know, with great interest what is going to happen when they finally bring all those ads together into one searchable database. Oh, indeed. And some of us are old enough to remember when we, we thought we would never really have anything resembling accurate numbers about the, the escapes of fugitive slaves, Underground Railroad, and all of that. We may get much closer to, to real numbers than we ever dreamed. I wanted to ask you, and one of our questioners outside has asked, what about these port cities, both in the South, uh, whether it's a Charleston or a Norfolk or somewhere else, but then in the North as well, a Philadelphia, a Boston and so on, New York. How did this phenomenon of maritime escape affect the kind of legal social situation in these cities? 
Yeah. Uh, both from the sites of escape and the sites to which they escape. Can you, could you comment a bit more on that? Because this put a lot of pressure, did it not? It did. On, on these southern ports and on the northern ports. Yeah. So, um, yeah, this, and, and that's another, you know, legislation and, and regulation is another way that we know that this was happening with great regularity because up and down uh, south of the Mason-Dixon line, up and down the ports of the southern eastern seaboard, Cities uh, make uh, municipal ordinances, states pass regulations that increasingly through the course of the 19th century put more and more pressure on, um, uh, on, on shipping and on a sort of a regulatory framework. They build a regulatory framework that is meant to try to stop this sort of sieve of people yeah, yeah. escaping out because it represented for them a huge economic loss. You know, this is capital that is draining away with every person that successfully escapes, but it's also a drain on their labor force. And, and it's a brain drain because many of these folks who are escaping are extremely knowledgeable and highly skilled at doing what they do. And so, uh, but on the other hand, um, the, the owner class of the South apparently didn't uh, find that it was economically feasible to, to draw their enslaved population away from the coast uh, mm -hmm. and, and replace the waterfront workers with, with, uh, with wage laborers who would not have the same incentive to run away. In other words, the, the enslaved African labor force along the waterfronts of the South was too valuable and, and, and uh, there was there was no incentive to change them. So they, they accepted escapes as a kind of cost of doing business. But the kinds of legislation that you get are uh, the creation of commissions and port authorities who have the, um, who have the, uh, the, 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 the right and the, um, the authority to search vessels, to fumigate vessels. They create stations for fumigation and vessels had to go through this before they could clear, clear the port and, and leave. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that in the, through the entire time of the Civil War, uh, sorry, of the 19th century prior to the Civil War, uh, the United States recognized a three mile coastal limit for legal authority. And mm -hmm. so a vessel sailing out of a southern harbor would very quickly be in international water and uh, at waters and pretty much beyond the, um, the arm of, of legal authorities. So any vessel master from the north who was inclined to assist knowingly uh, runaways could be uh, in international waters very soon after leaving a southern port. Well, in fact, uh, Tim, that's a key point, I think, because and you had an example there of that. I forget where that vessel sailed. Uh, it was a Philadelphia or whatever. The guy who was transporting fugitives up, up and down the coast. Uh, because there are some famous escapes where clearly the fugitive got some aid, even from ship captains. Yes. Rarely, rarely, but uh, in the case of uh, Harry Jacobs, yes, it's out of Edenton, North Carolina, because there was this ship captain who basically cooperated with her. <laughs> she made her own deal with him, so so, so to speak. But, well, one of the regulations that that builds up is increasingly you get uh, uh, regulations that create penalties for ship's captains that knowingly. Uh, yeah. aided in the escapes. And so this is one of the reasons why you have that newspaper ad like the one you found in New Bedford and others that have a, a ship's captain basically saying, I had nothing to do with this. It was completely beyond my control. Uh, this is how you can find your property. I'm giving you legal notice that this happened. And that way they created uh, the, the legal cover that they needed so that they wouldn't be prosecuted uh, in the South. But, but if they were caught red-handed, a captain could lose his livelihood, lose his vessel, uh, it, it would be confiscated. So there were all kinds of very dire um, uh, penalties. But if you were a free African American, and, and there were there were uh, laws uh, that controlled the movement of free African American mariners in southern ports, in many cases, they either had to stay on the vessel, or they were incarcerated in southern ports so that they couldn't interact with the free, sorry, with the enslaved black population. Uh, if they were caught, and and it was proven that they had assisted, I mean, this was a capital offense for a free black person in uh, North Carolina and other places in the South to assist in the escape of uh, a very valuable uh, piece of human cargo, uh, human property. And so, you know, the, 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 the penalties were extremely dire, no matter 
if you were um, uh, of African descent or uh, a white person, but they were worse if, obviously, if you were someone in the, in the uh, situation of being a free black mariner. And often, as is always the case, the, the development of law or you know, regulations or whatever is always evidence of the problem. Uh, I mean, as you well know, North, uh, South Carolina, as early as 1824, Right. You know, passes that Negro Seamen's Act. If you, if you were a black seaman that came into Charleston, they weren't allowed to, to get off the ship. That's right. I mean, it was just that's that's how early this problem was was so pertinent to a to a port like you know. The last thing I'll say, and I'm gonna turn it over to Michelle, and then we've got a lot of other questions happening here in the Q and A. Um, as I'm so glad you used the maps, and I'm sure you could have even used more detailed maps, because Anyone who doesn't understand the coast of the United States, the coast of, of the Eastern North America. I mean, if you just go down to the Sea Islands, Georgia, South Carolina, and then the, the bewildering uh, capes and, and inlets and outlets of North Carolina yeah. and Virginia and so on, you begin to realize in a maritime sense, slavery always, always could not be fully protected. It just couldn't because of the nature of that coast. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, and uh, anyway. Um, yeah, that's a good. Over to you, Michelle. Good place for me to jump in. I mean, I think there's the rich irony of this wonderful book is, you know, it reminds us of how much the U.S. economy, well, not just the U.S. economy, but the economies at that time were, were, absolutely dependent on maritime commerce. And that's the backbone of the economy. It's the backbone of slavery through the movement of, you know, forced movement of kidnapped people, but also the movement of goods all uh, up and down the Eastern seaboard and to the West Indies and back. Um, but the irony there is that, you know, because of the dependence on people of Africa, the labor of people of Africa to, descent in that maritime commerce, it opens up these, um, these cracks of uh, these opportunities that people actively took advantage of, as you so well highlight throughout the book. Um, so I guess my question is, and this is my perennial question um, that I'm always chewing on, is to what extent do you think that there's agency, not just in people actively seeking opportunities to escape, but in actually kind of constructing the shoreline, the Eastern seaboard um, as a series of nodes of maritime opportunities where people could sort of have stepping stones towards freedom in the North? I mean, we, you know, I've done some work on the oyster industry that connected the Chesapeake Bay and right here in New Haven, the waters of, um, of uh, Fair Haven here in New Haven. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, you know, all of these um, laborers, as they're making their way north, they're building little communities all up and down the seaboard, you know, between there and here, you know, crossing the Mason-Dixon line. Right. So I'm just wondering if you and your co-authors found any sense of that, like intentionality in crafting um, a, sh a shoreline that would be conducive to harboring um, migrants. Yeah, that's a, north. that's a wonderful and very interesting question. Um, the way I would I would reframe it a little bit because I the way I think about the maritime world uh, and 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 how it builds knowledge amongst the enslaved population of the South, the maritime people who are working in waterfronts and in ports get to develop a knowledge of geography that people inland don't have, and they wouldn't have conceived so much of an escape plan as being leapfrogging up the coast and connecting nodes, the, the goal would have been to get on a seagoing vessel that would go directly to the north. Because whether you had the cooperation of the crew or not, you wanted to make this as short of a voyage as you possibly could. Um, and, you know, under the best conditions, a voyage from even a place like Charleston, South Carolina to a place like Boston can be done under good conditions under a week. 
Uh, and so you don't have to pack along a lot of food or water uh, to, to sustain yourself on the voyage. And if you're secreted away in a vessel, the idea is that um, you will not have any of any, you won't have any contact with any of the other potential impediments that you would have on an overland escape. That said, uh, to address the point of your question, I think that uh, information moved from node to node. And, in, and, and people were able to exchange information along the coast about uh, that allowed them to maximize their escape effort. Uh, and so if you knew that a vessel might be putting in to the Chesapeake Bay from Charleston, South Carolina, you might be less likely to board that vessel and instead opt for one that would be going directly to New York or directly to uh, to Boston or, or someplace along the East Coast. I also want to drive home the point that you made that, that the Eastern seaboard of the United States anytime prior to World War I saw a, simply a cloud of vessels constantly in motion up and down the East Coast carrying all kinds of cargo uh, from North to South and South to North. The Northern shipyards and many Northern industries depended on, on goods produced by slave labor in the South. And the North produced all kinds of goods that, uh, that, that supported the plantation economy of the South. And so there's all this sea traffic going back and forth. And this gives a tremendous amount of opportunity to, um, uh, to enslaved people in the South to catch a ride to the North and, and, find, and find freedom. But I think the, the final point I'll make here is that it's information, Michelle, that is of most value. Right. Um, and and right. people build up a knowledge of, of how best to escape. Yeah. And I, I guess I'll just say one more quick thing before we turn it over to the Q&A. Um, we are accumulating a number of questions for you. Um, you, you made a point as you were wrapping up that, you know, we've lost uh, our connection to maritime history. But I think it's also true that maritime history has lost its connection to slavery to some extent. Certainly in the public history world, there's plenty of maritime museums uh, that somehow managed to tell the story of the U.S. or American maritime experience without even mentioning slavery. So I, I applaud you and your authors for um, working towards you know, making this visible. We just had this big conference, as you know, over the past weekend on Yale and slavery. Um, and there was a lot of talk about making the invisible visible. And um, so you, you all are certainly working towards that effort. And it's wonderful so it's work. Talk to all of us seascapes in addition to landscapes. Right. Right. Uh, we do have a lot of questions here, uh, Tim, and we can go on for a while. I hope you're willing. Sure. Uh, in the q and I'll, I'll, I'll combine two. One person asks, what about the Great Lakes? What do we know about that? And another says, what about the Mississippi River? Well, those are two huge geographies. But what, can you help people out a little bit? I mean, the Great Lakes were a major source of escape. Absolutely. One or another, and the Mississippi, to some extent, was too both up and down. Well, the key thing about the Great Lakes, of course, is that someone would be moving from a, uh, a zone where slavery was not legal, but where the um, Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 and, and earlier ones were in effect to a place where slavery was not legal. So it, uh, the Great Lakes are tremendously important uh, as avenues by which people moved by water from the US to Canada. Um, you know, we, um, quite deliberately drew the parameters of the book to include almost exclusively the Eastern seaboard. But sure. as with any project, one of the hopes of this scholarship is that it spins off other scholarship. So we're quite aware that there are, there are geographic regions that are really important that we didn't have space or inclination to cover. And the Great Lakes and the Mississippi River are uh, are, are, are two of those. Also the Gulf of Mexico going south to Mexico, which was another uh, area where people found uh, freedom because slavery was no longer legal there. Uh, and also the Caribbean. So people escaping to places like uh, Bermuda and the Bahamas and, and, uh, and, and the Caribbean were offered some opportunities as well. So we hope that additional scholarship after this book will address some of those. I will say this about the Mississippi River though, and there's been some talk about 
I've, I've received other questions about people escaping by steamboat up the Mississippi River. And I would say that uh, the, the possibility of being captured and re-enslaved along the Mississippi was much, much higher because you're, you're in inland waterways where yeah. the, uh, the jurisdiction of the uh, federal government is still in place and state governments and steamboats stopped regularly. So there yeah, were they're in the port of all the time. Yeah. All the time. And they're never far from a, a hostile shore uh, for the enslaved person. And so I think that the, uh, the likelihood of success was much better if you got aboard an ocean going vessel uh, going up the East Coast, or maybe along the, uh, the Gulf of Mexico uh, coast from a Gulf, from a Gulf port to a Mexican port, say, or a Caribbean port where, where slavery had been outlawed. But I look forward to other scholars looking at this and, and maybe answering some of those questions because I find them very fascinating and, and, and certainly very important. Well, in fact, uh, you know, Jim did much better off in the long run in, in Mark Twain's Huck Finn than most other futurists probably would have. Anyway, that's a fictional example, but a very, very, very famous one. Drawn from uh, life. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, I just just to mention, uh, there there is a book similar to yours, just, just came out a little while ago, uh, by, edited by Carolyn Schmartz Frost and... Uh, Afu, uh, forgetting the other person's name, but anyway, uh, uh, Professor Frost was here as a fellow at the GLC when she was conceiving it. It's a book about the Detroit area, the Great Lakes, uh, Ontario, it's similar book of essays. That book claimed that, uh, you know, again, claiming numbers here is always risky business on this story. That book claimed that the Detroit region was, the, you know, had the largest numbers of fugitives escaping into Canada. That may be true for obvious geographical reasons, if nothing else. And I can see other people now taking up your book and maybe even looking deeper at, uh, although people have already done it, haven't they? At certain cities, certain areas, certain regions. I also wanted to say, and I'd, I'd like to hear you talk a little bit more about this, Tim. Uh, you know, we're, we're talking here about how how prolific these escapes were, and they were. Um, but we don't wanna underestimate, I know you're not, but we don't wanna underestimate what bravery this took, what incredible risk these people went. The idea of hiding somehow in the hold of a ship and thinking you could get away with it uh, yeah. is, is just partly unfathomable to most people, I think. But the sheer steps of bravery by these people, yes, they may have had help here and there, but you know, what have you learned about that process? The, the, the ones, we know a fair amount about people who managed successfully to get to New Bedford mm -hmm. or to Boston or to Philadelphia or wherever, but we don't always know about the ones who got caught. Right. Uh, so, maybe you could talk a bit more about that because this, uh, this is sheer human um, almost superhuman bravery to try to do. You know, one of the constant problems with any kind of underground railroad scholarship is that this was illegal activity and it was clandestine. And so people didn't leave records usually. We have, we have accounts that are published later uh, after the Emancipation Proclamation and into the late, the late 19th century that, that often talk about these kinds of things. The step to decide to leave your home and get aboard a vessel uh, is does require tremendous uh, um, courage. Uh, it is a break with your known existence to try to go to an unknown existence. But I would argue that uh, some of that was mitigated by people who had knowledge of the sea. They knew. So in, in contrast to someone who's a inland landlubber, the people who were familiar with the ocean and knew that ships regularly traveled by water across the waters and they did it successfully, that maybe the leap uh, of courage didn't have so much to do with being afraid of traveling by sea, but, but the fear of the consequences of being caught. Yeah. Uh, and those were extremely high. Uh, and, uh, and so I think that that certainly was a, um, a, a, a factor that, that kept people from taking the step. But as the 19th century progressed, I mean, we saw the evidence in that one um, 
uh, newspaper ad where uh, a young woman had a father living in New Bedford. And they're almost one of the things that uh, mariners almost certainly did that were traveling between North and South. They conveyed secretly messages for family members. Uh, and this acted as a draw to, to uh, convince people who were still in the South to try to make a bid for freedom. Uh, so I think that that happened quite a lot. And this, of course, is one of the things that the owner class was absolutely terrified of, is the, the movement of information and the, uh, the, the encouragement uh, of, uh, by, say, free Black mariners or abolitionist white mariners uh, who were trying to um, encourage their, in their, their enslaved property to run away. So I, I take your point, and I think it's absolutely spot on about the courage necessary to do it. But I think someone who's familiar with the ocean and familiar with the way ships work is going to be significantly less concerned about uh, yeah. that process than, than about um, actually being caught and re-enslaved and then right. made sold into worse circumstances as a, as a consequence of having been, you know, someone who had been a trusted um, enslaved person who had been entrusted with um, uh, working independently on a fishing vessel or working independently as a ferry operator. If they then used that opportunity and that knowledge to try to escape and they were unsuccessful, they almost certainly would not be put back into the circumstances that, that had then allowed them to make that escape in the first place as a form of punishment um the 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 person who owned them would be would simply wouldn't be prudent to give them that circumstance again you know it, th there's a very interesting question here in the q a uh about the development of i mean you mentioned how the whaling industry became a way some fugitives could actually go to sea for two or three years mm -hmm. and and find jobs frankly but this person is asking about the development of American naval sea power in the 1840s. Yeah. And do, do, do you find, are you finding any evidence, if, if not, that's okay, that formerly enslaved people, you know, were finding their way into the U.S. Navy by this point? Absolutely. So yeah. um, another colleague of mine is uh, Carl Herzog, who is uh, a historian at the USS Constitution Museum in Charlestown Navy Yard. Uh, and they've been busily collecting information about African Americans who served uh, in the uh, Age of Sail Navy, the Constitution, and other surviving large sailing vessels. Uh, right. And they do have some evidence of people who had been born in the South uh, during the time of enslavement, and then maybe later claimed that they had been born elsewhere after the 1850 uh, Fugitive Slave Law. They started changing the story of where they were born. And you find people signing on board New Bedford whaling ships uh, doing the same thing. They have to give their place of birth. And maybe in 1835, they said their place of birth was what in the South. And then by 1850, they're saying it's someplace else. Anyway, the point is, is that uh, in, uh, uh, in the records of the uh, USS Constitution and other whaling vessels, uh, sorry, uh, military vessels that survive, you do have evidence of the same thing happening. Um, uh, people establishing their freedom and then working on, uh, on naval vessels in order to be outside the the reach of their uh, their owners. They also change their names. They do all kinds of things to yeah. uh, to uh, hide their origins. To identities, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, not not unlike a lot of other immigrants have changed their identity. Anyway, sure. uh, one last one here, which is interesting, and there, you may or may not have, have landed on evidence of this either. And I can't remember. If, it's been a long time since I read Jeff Bolster's book, but Michelle would know. <laughs> But this question is about, are you finding any evidence of African-born former slaves and the kinds of perhaps maritime skills that they brought with them uh, turning up in this fugitive slave story? Right, a fascinating question. Um, I mean, it's, I not easy, it's not easy to see probably in the records, but right. just curious. I can't, well, you know, the, actually there are a couple of fugitive slave ads from the 18th century that uh, mention people born, uh, who are African born, who have skills of, uh, as uh, water. Uh, uh, and and uh, I have it. That least, would be more likely for the 18th and the 19th anyway. Right. So. right. Yeah. So after 1808, uh, theoretically, we don't have any 
uh, African born people being brought to the United States as as enslaved people. So but the, the point here is that I, I've seen evidence of that in the 18th century, but not in the 19th. Um, OK, we I would say, too, that there's there is interesting evidence of uh, people who after the Civil War parlay their maritime skills into important businesses in the North. So there's at least one uh, guy who, who became a very well-known and, and much loved and respected resident of coastal Buzzards Bay, Massachusetts, uh, who mm -hmm. ran a, um, a fishing business. He took people out on a charter boat in Buzzards Bay for pleasure and for picnics and things. And he lived into the early 20th century and, and gets a wonderful obituary in the local newspaper. I think it's in Wareham, Massachusetts. Uh, but, but he was a guy whose story was very clear, had escaped enslavement from North Carolina, served in the U.S. Navy during the Civil War, and then, wow. um, and then becomes uh, a well-known vessel operator in Buzzards Bay, Massachusetts. As part of tour. As, as part, part of tour. Of yeah, yeah. Yeah. I just put in the chat um, a link to Kevin Dawson's book, which addresses um, African, uh, the, the maritime skills in the African diaspora. His book is Undercurrents of Power, Aquatic Culture in the African Diaspora. So he addresses that. But I think also, you know, just um, the use of canoes, you know, certainly in the Chesapeake and in North Carolina and, you know, all up and down the seaboard, um, which people of African descent in the Americas were so adept at. It's absolutely an African form, vessel form, and African skill that I think we can safely conjecture was brought to the new world. And Tim, we're getting- And that was so instrumental in escapes. The, be, the, the ability to navigate with canoes and you know row powered vessels vis-a-vis -vis sailing vessels was extremely interesting. You know, the, the Southern plantation economy depended on people bringing all of the products from in the river system, from the plantations down through the coastal waterways to the coast to be loaded on larger ocean going vessels. And all that work is being done by skilled African, uh, enslaved African watermen. So uh, your point is very well taken. You know, it's a reason why boatmen appear so much in songs, poetry, and right. so on. Uh, we're running out of time, Tim, but a, a measure of a great talk is the questions keep coming. And there's a request here for a bibliography. Somebody wants a list oh, of all the mentions. We can do that. Uh, and speaking of poetry, you know, the famous poem by Langston Hughes, The Negro Speaks of Rivers. Uh, you do wonder if maybe it's already been written by somebody, but you do wonder if there's a poet now going to write somehow some variation of the Negro speaks of oceans or something. I don't know. Because <laughs> there's so. there, that poem to be done as well. Um, this has been great fun, Tim, and, and we've all learned so much. I may turn it over to Michelle to take us out, but Tim, Tim thanks so much for doing this. And I hope we sold some of your books here. And uh, thank you all out there for coming today. It's been a great audience uh, and a great time. Um, if if folks know, want to write to me and email me with questions, I'm very happy to okay. receive emails so um, folks can do that. That'd be great. 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 I did put the link to your, um, your bio at the university in the chat so people can access that. And they can always contact us here at the Gilder Lehrman Center, gilder.lehrman.center at yale.edu if they want to. Uh, get in touch with you. Well, thanks so much, Tim. It's such a pleasure to have you with us. And I, I wish this was in person and I wish we could go out for some good Portuguese food afterwards. <laughs> and everybody go visit New Bedford. Yeah, you won't, you won't regret it. Yeah, if you come to New Bedford, let me know and I'll- yeah, uh, Give yourself a whole day there at least. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> a wonderful city. Thank thanks. you so, so much. I'm very grateful and uh, look forward to seeing you again in person. Okay. okay.